Born in England in 1809, Charles Darwin comes from the county of Shropshire. In the town of Shrewsbury, he grew up in a large Georgian home called The Mount, where he was the second youngest of six children. For the first 27 years of his life, Charles was under the roof of his father Robert, and although he was a wealthy non-religious doctor, he had his son Charles baptized as an Anglican. Charles, following his father's profession, traveled north to Edinburgh, where he attended the University of Edinburgh Medical School, the best medical school in the UK at the time. His older brother Erasmus was already there and excited for his brother's arrival. It will be very pleasant our being together. We shall be as cozy as possible. As Charles found himself uninterested with medical studies, he joined the Plinian Society in his second year at Edinburgh. The Plinian Society was made up of students who were materialists, who attempted to challenge the Christian view of science. The material world view tries to explain something beyond itself through its own limited lens. So it tries to get rid of the spiritual realm by looking at it through a material realm, saying there's only matter. The bad fruits of materialism are pretty simple. Your morality is out the window. Whatever man decides is a law, that's a law. And that's neither good nor bad, it's just pragmatic. Everything's pragmatic. There's no goodness, there's no right or wrong, there's no love, there's nothing. There's just this world, but there's nothing in it. There's nothing beauty and all. That's all subjective. That's just whatever you think it is, because it's just matter. There really is no such thing as beauty or goodness or any of that. There's just matter. Darwin's theory of evolution laid out in his 1859 On the Origin of Species is taught in virtually every school in America, and his ideas are widely accepted all over the world. For 150 plus years now, Darwin's theories have sparked major controversy in religious, mainly Christian, circles. While debate on the compatibility of Darwin's ideas with Christianity continues to be had, Darwin's own religious views are not debated. He wrote in his own autobiography, I gradually came to disbelieve in Christianity as a divine revelation. Darwin was heavily influenced by many thinkers, most notably Thomas Malthus and Charles Lyell. Malthus, an Anglican cleric, is the origin of all things related to overpopulation and population control. In 1798, he wrote the essay titled, The Principle of Population, The Future Improvement of Society. In it, he says, quote, The power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. To solve the problem that he invented, Malthus proposed checks to marriage, and also mentions what he called the preventive check. These checks were noticed by Darwin, as seen in his 1871 book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. Darwin names Malthus and his several checks, along with keeping down the population. Other followers of Malthus clearly understood these checks to mean birth control. This is why the Malthusian League, founded in 1877, promoted the use of contraception to limit family size. Limiting the population by means of contraception was the sole mission of the League. It acted as a precursor for the global birth control movement as seen in eugenicists Marie Stopes and Margaret Sanger. Their organizations started out as birth control facilities and currently operate as two of the largest abortion providers in the world. Sanger, founder and also president of the American Birth Control League at the time, which formed into Planned Parenthood, even wrote this invitation in 1925. This is the sixth international Neo-Malthusian and birth control conference. There's a couple things coming together here. There's this idea of birth control, of course, but there's also this idea of eugenics, which is being mixed in. The idea really is that you're going to create a super race of human beings and that certain other human beings are disposable. So Margaret Sanger has this idea of people who are not fit. And so those people just need to be wiped out of existence. Population control, which is nonsense, is about eradicating some people from the earth. Well, who gets to decide who gets to stay and who gets to leave? It's amazing that it's always people like Margaret Sanger who says, well, these are the people we don't want, but I'm fine. My family, we're good. Bill Gates, all these types of people, these eugenicists. But the good news is that the faster we improve health, the faster family size goes down. If they're so adamant about the population problem, why don't, you, why, don't you, why don't you lead the way? Give us a good example. This is a complete takeover of your freedom, your autonomy, and it's playing God in a very sick and evil way. The other strong influence on Darwin was Charles Lyell, who was also his close friend. Darwin even vented to him in 1861, saying in this letter, but I am very poorly today and very stupid and hate everybody and everything. 
Lyle wrote Principles of Geology when Darwin was in his early 20s. In the book, Lyle quotes so-called scientists whose studies contradicted and invalidated sacred scripture. As Lyle also implied the Genesis flood never happened, he knew Christianity was his opposition and even strategized how to get the church on board. Writing to George Poulet Scrope, his best friend and colleague, in an 1830 letter, if you don't triumph over them, but complement the liberality and candor of the present age, the bishops and enlightened saints will join us. While Darwin was guided by the likes of Malthus and Lyle, his own ideas influenced too many to count. The most recognized in carrying on Darwin's legacy were Thomas Huxley and Ernst Haeckel. The two were good friends with Darwin and hated the Catholic Church. Huxley, also known as Darwin's bulldog, said, quote, One of evolution's greatest merits in my eyes is the fact that it occupies a position of complete and irreconcilable antagonism to that vigorous and consistent enemy of the highest intellectual, moral, and social life of mankind, the Catholic Church. Haeckel agreed with Huxley, even saying that things like freedom and prosperity are opposed to the Catholic Church. Either the Church wins, and then farewell to all free science and free thinking, or else the modern rational state proves victorious. Then, in the 20th century, human culture, freedom, and prosperity will continue their progressive development. Along with Haeckel's disdain for the church, he was a German eugenicist who historians have pinned as the foundation for Nazi ideology. In 1904, he wrote the book, The Wonders of Life, which also has its mark all over Walt Disney World. In the book, Haeckel praises Darwin and also writes, these lower races, such as the Vedas or Australian Negroes, are psychologically nearer to the mammals, apes, or dogs, than to civilized Europeans. We must, therefore, assign a totally different value to their lives. Looking back on history, Darwinian evolution has impacted every culture around the world. It was endorsed by the founder of Marxism, Karl Marx, the leader of the Nazi party, Adolf Hitler, the head of the first Communist Party, Vladimir Lenin, and the father of American education, John Dewey. It's also infected the church as well, as it was endorsed by the founder of modernism, Alfred Loisy, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who had several of his works condemned by the church in 1962, and Edward Schillebeeks, who was the primary author of the infamous Dutch Catechism, and whose writings were also investigated by the Vatican for heresy. Loisy was actually excommunicated by Pope St. Pius X, and a year before that in 1907, he wrote the encyclical Ascendi on the doctrine of the modernists. In it, he defines modernism as the synthesis of all heresies, and among the chief of their doctrines is that of evolution. Modernism, in a nutshell, is marrying evolutionary thought with theology. So what's happening here is everything's in a state of becoming. Everything is in a state of process. There are no absolutes. It's just always becoming. What it's becoming? Who knows? Is it becoming better? Is it becoming worse? Well, there's nothing to measure it by because nothing is in an actual solid state. Everything is constantly moving, moving, moving. You end up with ideas like Alfred North Whitehead, who had this process philosophy and process theology, which states that God himself is, is in a state of becoming. He's trying to perfect himself or some absolutely crazy idea. So when you apply this to the church, it's absolutely devastating because it destroys every area of her life and of her authority. And what is really going on, because it starts philosophically, is it's subjectivism. It's this idea that it begins with me and it ends with me. So man is put in the place of God, man is sitting in the throne, and it's interesting that it's called modernism because there's really nothing modern about it. It goes back to Adam and Eve. You shall be like gods.